Welcome to episode 29 of When Fear Reigns. This is Ben Workentine. Uh, glad to host you guys today. I'm sitting across the table from Dr. John Parlow, and we are talking about the single life. Now, to get us started, to be clear, neither of us are single. Anthony over there, is, he's not single, um, but we were at one time. Um, and I don't know, when did you, how old were you when you got married to Lydia? I was 25. 25. I was 28, I think, when I married Kimmy. So, um, Went single for a little bit longer than the average. I think the average today is 27. So uh, certainly part of our experience. And I'm excited to talk about this today because I think it's an important one that a lot of Christians have a misunderstanding. I remember I was teaching about marriage and singleness. Now, this was a while back. And one dad who's had three single adult kids at the time just looked at me with slack-jawed when I said, it's okay to be single. It's okay to be a Christian and single. And he just, he was not ready to hear that. So I'm glad we're talking about it today. Um, to get us started, John, you got to tell, how did you meet Lydia? How did you hoodwink that woman into marrying you? It's it's a long sort of story, but I'll be happy to tell you uh, the you know the version of it that just hits the highlights. Uh, we both went I thought to the you were same. Tell me the PG version. <laughs> <laughs> we, we both went to the same prep school, Northwestern Prep in Watertown, Wisconsin, and uh, she was a sophomore in high school, and I was a junior. And um, uh, when you live at a prep school and you're in dormitories, they have a lot of rules. Many of which I didn't agree with, I'm, and <laughs> and I I didn't always follow shocker. them. Shocker, shocker. <laughs> and you know I was on student council. I think I was either the president or the vice president at the time as a junior. And I thought you know, and I was kind of active and popular and so on. And well, I had you have nine months of schooling. I was campused for six and a half months. What happens when you do some a violation? You get campus, which means you don't have the ability to go off campus during the weekends. And you can go off for like sporting events, but if you're playing in them, yeah, but otherwise yeah. you can't go off campus, go down and get something to eat or go to a movie <laughs> or something like that. And if you're really bad, you get dorm, yeah. which means you can't yeah. leave your dorm yeah. either. Well, I'd only dormed for a month, but I was so campus. So you and Lydia were long-term. No, no. I was, I, was cam- I was campus for six and a half months. And what happens is it was in the spring and I was campus. You know, little things like we moved the faculty furniture into the women's bathroom and and uh, <laughs> we, we rewired the alarm to the girls' girls. Uh, gymnasium, so we could, or not gymnasium, dormitory, so we could get up there in the middle of the night and scare them, and just you know mischievous things, not bad things, but just <laughs> I even got I got campus for two months for dating four girls in a six week period. I'm starting to and, be sorry that I asked that, this question. <laughs> that's, that was a violation, apparently I wasn't aware of. But anyways, so what happens is I'm walking around and I see her, and so I asked her out for a date, and we walked. Was she around. number four in that six? She's week number period? seven. Number seven. She's number seven, <laughs> and we walked around and. Uh, uh, the campus because I couldn't go yeah, off, yeah. And, and that was it. And after seven years of stalking, um, she finally said yes. In fact, when I asked her to marry me, she uh, said, "Well, I, well, I guess, well, I suppose so." That was her friend. <laughs> friend so that's it. But no, that's that's it. That's where we met on, yeah. on a campus. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, around here at St. Mark Ministries, we talk a lot about family ministry, especially a young family ministry. We just have a lot of kids and a lot of young families uh, that show up on the weekend. Uh, our partners here, but it can leave a single person, a single Jesus follower, feeling a little left out. Can you speak from the church's side now? How have you and your years of experience balanced serving and ministering to families and serving and, and uh, ministering to single singles over the years? I've always tried to put adults first because as we say here, whether you have children or not, adults have incredible impact on children's lives, whether that's your own children or a nephew or niece, or mm-hmm. maybe you're a teacher of children in the children's program at your local congregation. So it's all, I always put children first, I mean, adults first, mm-hmm. children second, because as we've said here, children are best served when adults are spiritually well-fed. Mm-hmm. That's a real key. I think it's making sure that you have balance in your discipleship, where you just don't gear everything toward parenting classes, but really spiritual growth, regardless if God has blessed you with a spouse and a child or not. And when it comes to applications, and as a preacher, you'll understand this, in sermons, be real careful with the language you, you use. Don't always give the impression you're talking to people who have a spouse mm-hmm. or who have family members, uh, like children. Uh, be real careful about that. Um, always make sure that that you're giving people the idea that you understand that they're in the room. Mm-hmm. Just like we try to do the same thing with unbelievers and skeptics. I know they're in the room. That's why sometimes I'll say, now, if you're an unbeliever and you're just here because you're dating the person sitting next mm-hmm. to you, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, or they promised you brunch if you showed up, mm-hmm. you know, don't listen to this part. You don't have to listen to this part. This is for the Jesus <laughs> followers. But I think you have to acknowledge they're in the room. And just by you understanding that they're in there, you might say, now, you know, if you're single or for people like that, you, you have to make sure you acknowledge that and don't make all of your applications, whether in Bible class or in sermons or in your writing, your newsletter mm-hmm. or your video mm-hmm. newsletter or cards, all applicable only to people who have a spouse. Mm-hmm. Just be cognizant of that. Mm-hmm. And I think a church that does a good job of that, even in that church, 
Christians can feel as though they aren't complete Christians. Sure. Um, until they're married or or even couples feel like until they have a kid. Is that how God sees them? No, you and I wouldn't say that. We would say marriage and or children mm-hmm. are a blessing from God, but not the only blessing from God. You look at, I would say this, Adam and Eve enjoyed perfection in the garden and there mm-hmm. were no kids. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's by accident. Mm-hmm. That's just my personal Well, and Adam view. enjoyed it before Eve. Yeah. And then they together before yeah, kids. Yeah, Good. yeah, absolutely. You've got that. You can, you know, Jesus was single. Mm-hmm. Paul apparently was single. I don't know if he was married and divorced or we're not really sure mm-hmm. about that. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've ever done some study on that, but he seems to... Yeah, by the time he writes those he, New he, Testament he, books, he's single. He's single. For I don't know his past yeah, then. Yeah. yeah, we don't know what his past was. But uh, understand, uh, God can give people the gift of singleness mm-hmm. and they can have great influence as well. In fact, as we'll talk about later, they probably have some advantages over those that yeah. aren't single. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how does a, a single Christian, I think a lot of married Christians or family, you know, for Christians who have families kind of equate singleness with lots of free time. And that's just not the truth you're, no. when you're single. So just kind of walk through, how does a single Christian kind of build boundaries and balance social life, uh, volunteering at church, helping out with their ministry, work, all that stuff. How, what are some other thoughts that they they need to balance when trying to figure out, out how they're going to spend their time? I think this is where the local church really needs to help people who are single, especially as we see millennials and now Gen Z, the the older group of Gen Z, older people in Gen Z's mm-hmm, generation, mm-hmm. Uh, reach those uh, mid-20s to upper 20s and as they're staying single longer, mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. now into their 30s and first marrying then. Mm-hmm. I, I think the church really has to be um, ready to help those people. And I think one of the best ways to do that is small groups. Mm. You need to have a group of people with whom you do life. You and I tell people a lot, hey, listen, at one of our, every, any one of our six services and our online service as well, you can go ahead and sit in pews. We like when people are in straight lines, chairs or mm-hmm. pews. That's mm-hmm. nice. Mm-hmm. But it's really helpful to do ministry in circles mm-hmm. where you're with other people who can pray with you, encourage you, disciple you discipline you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Hold Call you out. accountable. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All those things are, are really key. And I, I think that really does benefit the person who doesn't have a spouse who in some cases does all of those things mm-hmm. and should, mm-hmm. right? As you work as a team. But as a single, there is there is a need for accountability. There are a lot of options out there. And you're right. Generally speaking, single people seem to be very busy too, Mm -hmm. just like married people, just a different busyness. But I think you have to make sure that you have an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know who that is for you or me. You know, if if I'm talking to the person listening right now, but that's important. Someone you can confide in, Mm -hmm. someone that you Mm -hmm. can trust that aren't Mm going to go, you know what she said, or you Mm -hmm. know what he Mm -hmm. said, Mm -hmm. let's not do that. But uh, the idea that you build hedges. Again, we mm-hmm. talked about in an mm-hmm. earlier podcast, know yourself. Mm-hmm. Know, okay, I'm single. I have been tempted in this area. I've fallen in this area. Mm-hmm. I personally have to build a hedge. I, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe others can. That's not good for me. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have a marriage partner, guess what? They actually know if it's, you know, they'll, they'll be able to hold you accountable, yeah. but you don't have that when yeah. you're single. That's important to have that kind of accountability partner. And just the building the hedges, there's a book years ago called Building Hedges, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes people call it guardrails. Mm-hmm. Just know your weaknesses and your strengths, know about your family of origin, know about your propensities, mm-hmm. know about um, what's going to come your way, mm-hmm. and plan accordingly. But I still think the best thing the local church can do, or one of the best things, is make sure you are very, very detailed and very the word I'm looking for. Very straightforward in trying to get people, in, intentional, trying to get people mm-hmm. into mm-hmm. small groups. Mm-hmm. And I know that you're taking that yeah. job on here, and I really appreciate your work and, and those that work with you, both paid and unpaid volunteers. Yeah. That, that's important because I don't know if anybody, single or married, but especially single, wants to go through life during that time period or through the rest of their life not having someone that cares about them. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, it's a small group or maybe you're a, a member of a smaller church and, you know, that church kind of acts as that small group. Do you have any thoughts on should a small group be just singles? Should it be a mix of singles and married people and married people with kids, people with the singles with kids? Like what are the, some of the benefits and maybe pros and cons of 
a group that all looks like you and a group that's really diversified in stages well, of life. There's probably pros and cons to both. I mm -hmm. mean, if you're a, in an all singles group, certainly you can all empathize and you know mm -hmm. exactly. It's mm -hmm. like when you're in a group with people who've recovered from cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one thing for another person who's never done that to say, yeah, I bet you that's really hard. Sure, yeah. Well, they haven't been there, done that. Yeah. I think there's some of that in the singleness too, where you can say, you know, what about some the, camaraderie lo what about the loneliness? From, yeah. And yeah. How do you handle that? Yeah. I think that's appropriate. I also think it's appropriate to be in a mixed group where you have maybe someone who's single, mm -hmm. someone who's spiritually single, meaning they're married, but their spouse isn't a Jesus sure. follower, and they yeah. end up coming to church sometimes even with the kids by all themselves. by themselves. Yeah. That's really yeah. tough. That's yeah. really tough. It's yeah. a growing group. Or maybe you've got uh, a couple where the kids are out, empty nesters. I think we can learn from each other, and certainly those that have been Jesus followers longer have wisdom to hand down to the next generations. Mm -hmm. Because even though they're married now and they're empty nesters, they were single ones too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sin is sin, and those temptations are temptations, and opportunities yeah. are opportunities. Yeah. yeah, some of the things change, but not not yeah. drastically like that. So I think there's pros and cons to both. And uh I think it's beneficial to at least offer both and let that person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who's single choose which one is going to best mm -hmm. help him mm -hmm. or her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think speaking to the, maybe in that mixed group, the ones who are married and have kids, because I, I see this in my own um, my own life and our, my, our small group, you're not just about your kids. So if you're, if you're married and have kids and you're in a group with somebody who's single, don't just talk about your kids. Be cognizant of who's around you yeah. and be... Be willing to listen and hear, and don't assume you know uh, what they're going through because you are young and single. And ones. that's that's nice to do. I mean, if if you're just remember, if you've ever been to large groups mm -hmm. where you have a bunch of people, people who are new parents have a tendency to just gush about their yep. kids, or they're yep. they're brand new into high school now, yeah. and so all they try is talk about it. And at yeah. some point, you have to say very nicely, "That's great." Yeah. Or they love their career. I've heard that too. Yeah. People just, just get just, talking. They just get talking and yeah. talking and yeah. talking. I think it's beneficial for people sometimes to jump in and say, okay, let's let's change the subject yeah. And, yeah. and the direction. Yeah. And I think yeah. having a single person there helps that because that yeah. person at some point is going to realize, oh, he doesn't have any kids. Yeah. yeah. It, let's talk about something we have in common. Yes. Let's talk about Correct. Yeah, Correct. Yeah. For sure. Uh, there, are some, there are, however, some advantages to being single. In fact, the Apostle Paul recommends it. And we talked a little bit about what was his background. But at the at the time he writes First Corinthians, he is single. And he says, I would prefer that you would stay single. What are some things that a single Christian brings to the table that a married Jesus follower just doesn't isn't able to? You have fewer people that you are primarily responsible for. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for yourself. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't have impact on nephews and nieces or sure. the, the young people God that you're mentoring and, yeah, yep. and so on and godchildren, all of that. But you have less primary responsibility. That means you may have, depending on your career course, mm -hmm. you may have more time in which to serve people, mm. to make a difference in people's lives, to not only share your faith, but really show mm -hmm. your faith. Because mm -hmm. as we know, don't tell me what a friend I have in Jesus until I see what a friend I have in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you, you would probably likely, not always, but likely have more time mm -hmm. with which you can serve other people, mm -hmm. make an impact in other people's lives, or more time to grow in your faith. I, we know when you're uh, uh, parents and you've you got young kids, you barely have time to sleep. All you, you're either <laughs> feeding them or you're changing them. Yeah. Or as yeah. they get to be toddlers, and Anthony's realizing this now, you're, fi you're trying to find out where they hid. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're looking around, and then you're worried that they fall down the stairs. And then, yeah. Or, you know, where exactly is my child or my children? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you don't maybe have a lot of time. But when you do have time, when they finally fall asleep, you're exhausted. <laughs> So yeah, I think that a single person might have a little more energy mm -hmm, <laughs> a mm -hmm. lot of times, probably a little better sleep pattern. Yeah, yeah. And maybe because of those things and others, maybe have greater time and opportunity for influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a, that can be a really powerful thing to be able to say, hey, God has God has given me this station in life right now to be single. Maybe, maybe you long to be married. Maybe that's not an interest to you at all. And that seems to be the case for Paul that he wasn't, he didn't seem to be interested Correct. in that. Correct. God had given him the gift of singleness and that's a gift. Yeah. And to, to see that as a gift, not as a burden or not as something to get through. Or, or there's somehow you're, you're not whole unless you're married. Right, right. Or you're not normal or you're really not a Christian. Mm -hmm. I don't know who teaches that, but if they do, that's just right. anus. Well, and I don't know. I, I think a lot of times, and I, I recognize this as being a dad of a small family, like sometimes People don't say it, but you have this ideal in your mind or, or you catch this idea that it's better to have four kids or it's better to be married or better to, to you know, whatever. And you whether somebody says it or not, you can kind of have that that guilt that comes with, Correct. I don't have the perfect, what I would consider the ideal. Or Correct. maybe you, you hope to be married, you wish to be married, and you're not yet. And you feel like, 
God hasn't given me what what's really good for me, and and to so it turns into a burden instead of a an opportunity for a time. Well said. Well, thank you for joining us as we talk about the really important role that single Jesus followers have to play in the kingdom of God as as valuable, as important, as unique gifts uh, to the church. I hope you got some insights today. Um, Hope you are finding a a group of believers to kind of gather with and surround yourself with to encourage you, to remind you of Jesus' love. If you have struggles with that or you're looking for a group, uh, make sure you reach out to uh, us. We'd be happy to connect you with one. You can uh, find us on Instagram or Facebook or reach out to us at info at whenfearreigns.com. Loved having you today as we talk about Christian Mingle. Hope our time together has allowed the fear of God to reign in your life.